We're going to be in John chapter 12 today, so if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me there. We're only going to read a a couple of verses, a short passage there uh, about the triumphal entry, Uh, but I want us to reflect this morning about that. I've entitled this message, uh, Behold the Lamb. And, uh, and there's a lot of truth I want to hopefully convey to you. We're going to begin, though, going back in the book of Exodus, uh, uh, the setting, if you will. Sometimes when we are caught up in our uh, contemporary celebration of a thousands of year old celebration, uh, we forget the context or the meaning behind And what we call or celebrate today as Resurrection Sunday or Easter uh, Sunday was actually coincided with what the the Jewish uh, uh, folks called the Passover. And we find the Passover um, origin, if you will, in the book of Exodus chapter 12. And I'll read just a few short uh, verses because this is relevant Uh, in regards to what's going on in Jerusalem this morning. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. I want to say to you that this is a foreshadow, this is a prophetic reference of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, and uh, that is the theme of our message tonight. Our Sunday school lesson this morning uh, talked about this as well. Um, Jesus' death upon the cross uh, was not a miscalculation. It was not an unfortunate event. It was not something that God and Jesus did not uh, know about. It was foretold from the very beginning. And so uh, as we look at uh, the celebration of Jesus coming in, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, this is the backdrop for the nation of Israel. It is the Passover. They are reflecting upon Jesus, or, or God's deliverance of them from the bondage of Egypt. And just as God delivered the nation of Israel from the bondage of the slavery of Egypt, Jesus Christ delivers us from the bondage of sin. And that is the picture that is painted for us today. And so we look at the Passover and we see in Exodus chapter 12 verses 13a the prophecy. Now the blood shall be for a sign or be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood I will pass over you. I've told you before I find the Passover to be the most perfect image of what Jesus Christ did for us. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Uh, Jesus Christ died upon the cross. His blood, the Bible says there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And Jesus Christ shed his blood that you and I might have remission of sin. And folks, when this is still in place today, when God the Father sees the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, paid for your sins, he passes over you. And I rejoice in that. Uh, when God looks down upon me, when the, the accuser of the brethren who comes before God making accusations against you and me, God looks down and he says, the blood has been applied, the debt has been paid, I will pass over him. And I rejoice in that. I don't understand it, I don't deserve it, but I rejoice in it. It is my security, it is what I walk in, it is all that I am and it's all that you are if you are a believer. So prophetically it was told, it was typified through the sacrifice of the lamb in the book of Exodus for the children of Israel and it will be, it will be typified again in the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior 
Jesus Christ. So it is prophetically true. Jesus is the person, by the way. If you go to John chapter 1 and verse 29, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, what does John the Baptist say the next day? John saw Jesus coming toward him and said what? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was not an accident, folks. We knew it, uh, 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 we knew it was coming. Uh, the prophets told it was going to happen. Jesus knew it was going to happen. It was foretold. And John, uh, <laughs> the forerunner of Christ, when he saw Christ, he said, Behold, the, he, he may as well have said, Behold the sacrifice of God. Because the Lamb of God had only one purpose, and that was to give its life for the sins, uh, for atonement for the nation of Israel. And so he was not only prophesied of, uh, he appeared in the person and was recognized as the person that became the Lamb of God. And then in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12, we read, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So he's the prophecy, he's the person, and he's the propitiation. That means he's the payment. He's the total and absolute payment for our sins. The blood of goats and calves and sheep and doves was insufficient and had to be made year in and year out for the nation of Israel and for the individuals and for individual families. But the sacrifice of Christ is made one time for all mankind. And I rejoice in that. We said this morning, we were talking in our Sunday school class, Jesus died upon the cross. His blood paid the price for all the sins of all mankind for all eternity. That does not negate our personal responsibility. The fact that Jesus' blood is sufficient does not take away our individual responsibility to make atonement with God, to, make, to have a personal relationship with Him. So we look at the Passover and we see it as prophetic and that Jesus personified the, the, the Lamb of God and that He paid the sins. And then we look in John chapter 12, verse 12 and 13, and that's our text for today. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now the first thing this was for you and I, this was a cry of identity. The children of Israel were in a bondage. They were under the dictatorship of the Roman uh, kingdom, but they, did, they retained their national identity. And folks, let me say to you today, you know, I am an American citizen. I served in the United States military, proudly so, but I am a citizen of the kingdom of God and I identify with Christ. And if the nation of the United States goes south or sideways with the word of God, I will identify with the word of God over the United States of America. When I joined the military, and there are others in here, I think about Tom back there was in the, uh, uh, in the Navy, and others of you served, you, you, you took an oath when you joined to uphold the Constitution and, and to defend this nation. But folks, I took a stronger oath to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as they were identifying themselves, in fact, if you go back historically, the palm branch was used during the Maccabee period. It was a symbol of Jewish nationalism. And when, they, and when they took it up and made this cry, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel, they were identifying themselves as Jews. And they were proudly doing so. And folks, let me say to you this morning, we have opportunities every day to identify ourselves as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't carry palm branches to work with us, but we do carry our testimony. And folks, there will be times when people will say things and do things and it will give you opportunities to wave your palm branch. It will give you opportunities to let people know that you identify with the Lamb of God. 
Now, there are consequences with identifying with the Lamb of God, and many times that's the reason we don't do it. But sadly, in America, the biggest consequence you're going to face is some mild embarrassment or ridicule. Words. Words. I remember the old nursery rhyme, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words can never hurt me. But, oh, they do hurt us because they cause us not to identify with Jesus Christ. So the palm branches waved this morning was, an, was a cry for identity of their Jewish, uh, their, 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 their identity of the nation of Israel. It was a cry for independence because they didn't want to be. They thought, wrongly so by the way, but they thought Jesus might come and usurp the authority of Rome. In fact, Caiaphas, the high priest himself, was afraid that Jesus' activities were going to cause civil unrest and, and invoke the wrath of Rome. And he said it's better that one should die. He didn't know he was being prophetic, but he was, he was when he said it. But he said, he said we're going to put one to death that we don't undergo this. And so this was a cry for independence. And I want to say to you this morning that if you identify with Jesus Christ, it's a cry for independence in your life. It makes you different. It, it gives you liberty. It is a cry to be free from the burden of sin. It is a cry to be free from the responsibilities of this world. And I rejoice that Jesus Christ changes our lives. He makes us different. Now, he doesn't take away the burdens of life, but he gives us peace and he gives us contentment. He gives us consolation. He gives us grace. He gives us mercy. He gives us joy. And he gives us, I've said this over, he gives us a biblical worldview so that when we see the bad things happen in our life, we aren't fearful, but we're confident that God is in control and that everything is on schedule. And it was a cry for them for intervention. They looked around at their circumstances and they wanted a change in their lives. Folks, let me remind you this morning, we live in a broken world, severely broken. And whether the world... Listen, don't believe everything that somebody tells you. I've encountered people in my life that were, were staunchly against uh, a Christian testimony until they got sick or until some heartache came their way or some issue of, 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 of major concern came their way. And then they would call upon me and ask me if I would pray for them. You see, what they're saying when, when in the midst of, of everything being okay and what they say when their life is, is in total distress are two different things. And the world is crying out for intervention and the power of, God, of the gospel is as strong today as it has ever been. It is not diminished by our liberal um, um, uh, worldview. It is as powerful today as it has ever been. And let me encourage you just to remember that. Your life, I shared this just, to, perhaps it was last week, we were talking about memorizing scripture verses. Uh, your life is the most powerful weapon that you have. Your changed life that the world is looking in. The people who saw you before and see you today. Are, they, are, they are curious as to why that occurred in your life. And so as we look at this crowd this morning and they're waving palm branches and Jesus is coming in on the donkey and it's his triumphal entry. This is only days after Lazarus has been resurrected from the dead. His notoriety is at a peak. In fact, the scripture says that the Pharisees sought even to kill Lazarus because of the notoriety that his resurrection brought to the ministry of Christ. But the world around us is hurting. And we have an opportunity to speak for Christ. And, but we have to believe that speaking for Christ will still do something. And unfortunately, so many of us have, have taken the position 
that, that they've heard it and it doesn't do any good to tell them again. Folks, tell them again and again and again and again. As long as we have breath, we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ because we do not know on what day or what hour that our proclamation will be heard. Then we look at the praises. So the next day a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard Jesus come into Jerusalem took branches. This was an exuberant time. We can't imagine. Um, I was reading one commentary and they were talking about Josephus, a famous Jewish historian, gives record of one year 256,000 sheep were slain for the Passover. Can you imagine how many people came into Jerusalem for that event where there would be 256,000 sheep slain? This was a powerful, powerful praise event that was taking place, sadly, only days before the crucifixion of our Lord. But first of all, the praise is appropriate. We look in Luke chapter 19 and what we shared with the children. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. God is worthy of our praise. God is worthy of our praise. We, you know, we so often neglect to thank God for the very basic things that come our way that we take for granted that we perhaps think that we we did on our own, but every breath that we have is a gift of God. Our intellect is a gift of God. Our talents are a gift of God. All that we have is a provision that God gave us. And so praising God is an appropriate thing at every juncture. And folks, again, when we're talking about, we're talking about they're coming in, they're waving palm branches. Now this is literal, but figuratively in our lives, are you waving a palm branch for the Lord in your life? Does the world around you see and identify you as a believer? Could they pick you out of the crowd? We know the Pharisees weren't waving palm branches, by the way. They were the ones that would said, uh, uh, Rabbi, tell your followers to stop doing this. They didn't have palm branches. So not everybody, not all the religious people, are waving the palm branches for God. And I ask you today, are you praising God in your life? Does the world around you see and hear the praises of God in your life? You know, we like to bellyache. If you pick up a newspaper, I dare you to find good news. I dare you to find good news. I've shared with you before when I was a young man, I, uh, a child, I sold the grit paper. And the grit paper advertised there was nothing but good news. There was no bad news in the grit. Now the grit's a magazine today, and I haven't read it in years and years. But our newspapers, they say, if it bleeds, it leads. I was listening to this week, and I don't care a thing about the royal uh, family in, um, in England, uh, but I happened to uh, be listening to the news on the radio, and they were saying uh, that uh, Princess Kate had doctored some photos, photoshopped some photos, and there was a big uproar, and they had uh, a, a, a bunch of different things that they, they thought must be happening. Prince Harry must be having an affair. All kind, nothing good, by the way. Well, they released yesterday or day before that Princess Kate has stomach cancer and doctored the pictures for that matter. But our, our, that doesn't sell newspapers. That doesn't, we, we look for things that will be salacious. But it's appropriate to praise God to tell people the good things that God has done for you in your life. Hey, they, listen, they might walk away. Well, I don't want to be around that person. They're always just, you know, smiling and telling how good God is. But what a testimony. I've catched myself sometimes. I've told you I'm a cup half full person. I don't, I don't, I'm not a gloomy Gus. I'm a can-do person. I believe you can fail any day of the week. That's the starting place. Let's go from there. 
It's not, it doesn't take any effort to fail. But some people, they just, they just want to dwell in the negative. And as Christians, let me remind you to praise God for the good things that He's done in your life. That's what they, He said, if you don't, the stones would cry out. God deserves our praise. Then he shares that not only is it appropriate, but it was urgent. The word Hosanna literally means save now. Save now. Folks, we need God's intervention in our lives. We need God's deliverance. We need God's intervention in our nation. We need God's intervention in our relationships. We need God's intervention in our health. We need God's intervention in our finances. We need God every day, and it's urgent. I've told you many times what the, and I've been guilty of this myself, so I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm speaking from my own experience bad things or difficult things come our way and we, we pull out the books and we say, how are we going to manage this? We look at our bank account. We look at our insurance policy. We look at our jobs. We look at everything that's going down the line. And then when we've run out of choices, we say, well, we, maybe we better pray. No. We pray first. We pray believing that God will take care. He says, casting all our care upon Him because He cares for us. We trust in the provision of God. And so God was being praised today. It was an appropriate praise. It was an urgent praise. He was saying, they were saying, save us now. Oh, that the world, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. Oh, if, if the cry for repentance were urgent in our life today, what a difference it would make. What a difference it would make. But so many times we're not worried about it. We're living in comfort. We're living in our, our situation just going along. So their praises were appropriate. They were urgent. They were accurate. He was the King of Israel. He was the Lord of Lords. And He still is today, by the way. They didn't miss the mark. Now, they were telling them, don't say this. Why? Because they were saying, Jesus is. He's going to have a, he's going to have a placard over His cross uh, when He's hung that says, King of kings and Lord of lords, King of the Jews. He was who he said he was. And folks, he is today, and he's coming again, by the way. And he will come again, not as the lamb, but the lion of Judah. And I look forward to that. But it was accurate to praise him. And folks, it's accurate today for you to tell people that there is no other name given among men but whereby you must be saved. No other name. Not Buddha, not Mohammed. There is no other name given among men. There are no other ways to heaven. The Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The world doesn't like it. The world finds it intolerant and excluding. But God said, I have come. <laughs> I'm patient and long-suffering, desiring that none should perish. We reflected this morning our Sunday school lesson, Jesus Christ dying on the cross, got nails in his hands and nails in his feet. He's been scourged with a cat of nine tails with leather and, and bone that has ripped the flesh. He's had a thorn of crowns pressed down upon his head. He's been spit in his face. He's been pummeled. He's carried his own cross to the hill of Calvary. And he's the God of the universe. And as he hangs on that cross... He says, sick them, God. No, that's not what he said, is it? He said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. No other God on this planet has ever made such a compassionate appeal for the people of this planet than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. If any one of you had the power of creation at your voice, all that you had to do was speak a word. None of us would be here. None of us would be here. 
The song says he could have called 10,000 angels. He didn't need 10,000 angels. He could have spoke a word. He spoke the world into existence. He could have spoke a world, a word and changed his circumstance. But he loved you enough to die. He is king of kings. He's not only the king of Israel. He's the king of the world and the king of the universe, the king of all that ever was. Unfortunately, some of their praises were misdirected. We don't know who's going to be in the crowd a few days later yelling, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas. But surely some of the same crowd would be there. And that's a sober reminder. I told the Sunday school class this morning and I, you know, I always, I look back and I, I think about the children of Israel in the wilderness who roamed for 40 years in disobedience and stubbornness and rebellion against God. It didn't take 40 years to get to the promised land. The path, the map wasn't that long. It's as if they did figure eights in the wilderness for 40 years. And I'd like to say I would have been one of the good guys. Wouldn't have been me. I would have been a Joshua or a Caleb, and I, I pray that I would have been. But unfortunately, there were a whole lot of people and a few Joshuas and Calebs. And that's sobering to me. And when I think about these people and the clamor of the crowd and the palm branches and everybody shouting, Hosanna, king of the Jews, king of Israel, son of David. How could they make such a radical change in just such a short time? And I have to examine my own life. I challenge you to examine yours. Are there times in your life when you should have been praising God, but you chose not to? You chose to keep quiet? Or you chose to join in with a group doing something that you knew you weren't supposed to do to start with. And you knew who you were. And you knew whose you were. But you didn't want to be unpopular. You didn't want to be out. You wanted to be in with the in crowd. And folks, disingenuous praise of God is worthless praise. If you don't genuinely love Him, if you don't genuinely feel sincerely that He is who He says He is, your praise doesn't mean anything. And so some in this crowd had a misdirected praise. They were waving a palm branch one day and would forget about it the very next day. Jesus had just raised somebody from the dead. He's a spiritual superstar. But oh, how quick popularity fades. And I challenge you this morning, praise God all the time. Praise Him when it's popular. Praise Him when it's not popular. And I'm preaching to me just as much as I am to you. Praise Him all the time. Remember, when you, when you think about, I'm not going to praise God, I want you to have a, I'm going I'm I'm to do like the uh, hypnotist on the, on the television um, I, I'm gonna, I'm, I want you to think about a palm branch. It's going to come into your mind, a palm branch. When you have the opportunity to praise and you choose not to, you're going to see a wave in palm branch. And I hope that reminds you, encourages you, incites you to praise God no matter what. Now, in the crowd were sincere people. And today, folks, in our company, there are sincere believers. There are people who are faithful to God. I've seen it over the last three years that we've been here. I've seen your sincerity. You've been there when you're up, and you've been there when you're down. You've been alongside people to help them. And, you've, and you, you, you're faithful. But there were some in the crowd who were not. They were there because Jesus was popular. They were there because everybody is, everybody's doing it. Give me one of those palm branches. They were there because it didn't cost them anything 
today. What any consequence to praising God? That's the sincere. I hope you're in that number today. There were the self-serving in that crowd. There were people who followed Jesus throughout his ministry for what Jesus could do for him, for them. And Jesus does a lot for us, but if you're only serving God for what God can do for you, you are not serving God. Because God did not call you to serve you. God called you and He called me to serve Him. And our service for Him will cost us something and it will take us places we don't want to go and it will put us in situations that are difficult and uncomfortable sometimes. Some of the crowd in this were self-serving. They were hoping Jesus would be able to meet their personal need. He's raised somebody from the dead. What can He not do? Let me get to him. Not so I can believe he's king of kings. Not so I can give my life to him. Not so I can surrender. Oh, as pastors, you know what? We encounter people all the time that want us to pray for them. Pastor, I'm sick. Will you pray for me? What about your spiritual health? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Have you, have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Well, no, preacher, I don't want to talk about that. I can't help you. I can't help you. I'll I'll pray for you. But your spiritual health is secondary to your... I mean, your physical health is secondary to your spiritual health. There were the skeptical in the crowd. Those who were on looking. We, We talked about the Pharisees. Maybe there's somebody here today that's not sure about Jesus. They grew up in the Bible Belt. They know the name. They know what everybody says about him. It's, 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 it's the time of year when everybody, you go by, I, I travel through the county, and praise God for this, by the way. We see crosses in front of churches draped in purple, and we see flowers on the front doors of churches. We see all the trappings of the resurrection. Nobody can stand before God and say, I, I didn't know. <laughs> well, I'm thankful we live in that kind of a community, by the way. But some people are saying, well, I I see all that, but I'm just not sure he's real. Just not sure he's real. I'm going to grab one of these palm branches because that's what everybody's doing. And that's certainly sad. If your praises for God are uncertain. Friends, Jesus is the king of the universe. He is Lord of lords. He's coming again. He's not dead, by the way. We said last week in our sermon, or a week before. He's seated on the right hand of the Father. He's active. He's motivated by the events in your life. He cares about you. And then, finally, there were the situational. Those who would, when it favored them, Go another direction. Now, of course, these people are not sincere believers by any stretch of the imagination. And, you know, I I said before, we live in the Bible Belt. And uh, for years, and this was one of the things, pastors talk about this, and church conferences, they talk about this. Um, There are people who are members of churches, uh, starting really in a post-World War II period in the 50s, uh, it was popular to belong to the church. And uh, I was uh, was talking with Philip White at Cliffside, and he was principal at Cliffside Elementary for years, and he showed me some old documents of the teachers, and the teachers were required to go to church. Required to go to church. It wasn't optional. Required to go to church. Uh, It was part of their employment contract. Might happen, times changed. Businessmen went to church. Because they wanted the appearance of being in the right place with the right group. Politicians went to church. We don't live in that day today. But some of those people, when it was no longer popular, when it was no longer expected, 
drifted away from the church. Situational. Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. It's no longer in my, it's no longer in my best interest to be Christian. Again, sad testimony. I hope today that as you hold the palm branch in your hand that you will think about who you are, who you would have been in that crowd, and who you are in the crowd today. Are you praising God because you know Him? Do other people know you know Him? Are your praises continuous in the good times and the bad times? Do people see your faith shining through no matter what's going on in your life? Or is your faith situational? You get angry, you get bitter, you get mad. Jesus Christ is as powerful today as he has ever been. And as we reflect upon this time of year, we do this to remind you uh, of who Jesus is and, and uh, what he uh, means to you and to me. And I rejoice. I rejoice that the scripture remind us, reminds us each year that Jesus paid it all. That he, he made the supreme sacrifice that we might have life and that more abundantly. Well, I don't know what your circumstance is this morning. I'm going to ask that our musicians come forward. And I, I want you to use this time of reflection. Of course, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to invite you to invite Jesus into your heart. To ask Him to forgive you of your sins and to be your Lord. And He is faithful. He will do that. He says, I'll cleanse you from your sins, from all unrighteousness. And, uh, but if you are here today and you know Jesus Christ, but you haven't been praising God in your life, if people are looking in on your life, they're not, seeing, they're not seeing joy. They're not seeing peace. They're seeing chaos or maybe bitterness or anger. I want you to, I want you to give it to the Lord today. I want you to start next week, this is Holy Week, I want you to start this week with a fresh commitment to be fearless in your praise of God. Wherever you go, whatever your circumstance, to be fearless in your praise of God. As our musicians sing, won't you join us?